Hello, my name is Juan Santiago. I'm a faculty member at the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Stanford University. And I'd like to um, tell you a little about our work on CRISPR-Cas uh, enzyme, enzyme kinetics, as well as CRISPR-Cas applications uh, for diagnostics. So we are, my group originally um, came to study CRISPR kinetics um, because we were developing a microfluidic assay uh, for CRISPR, um, but that opened uh, into new work uh, for us, new work on the kinetics of CRISPR. And that's what I'd really like to focus on today. Um, I have a couple of my co-authors here who are uh, students who have contributed to this. And I'll try to point out specific um, uh, contributions they've made along the way. So to tell you a little about CRISPR-Cas uh, kinetics, um, I'll give you an example of CRISPR-Cas12A, uh, one of the orthologs of CRISPR. This is uh, an enzyme that can be used as a diagnostic. So for the diagnostic applications of CRISPR, um, the enzyme here is depicted um, as this yellow blob. The enzyme is functionalized with a guide RNA molecule. It's a synthetic RNA molecule that has a spontaneous um, folding or spontaneous three-dimensional structure, which recognizes the uh, enzyme and attaches to it. And then it has a reconfigurable sequence, um, which is shown here in this red tail. And you can make the sequence complementary to the target of interest, the nucleic acid target of interest. For Cas12a, uh, the target is DNA, but there are CRISPR uh, orthologs that work with RNA. So um, once you have uh, nucleic acid, typically there has to be some cleanup, some purification. You functionalize in advance, in advance of the assay, the enzyme with this guide RNA. When you put them together, what you're looking for is the so-called uh, cis cleavage reaction. And that's where this complementary strand on the guide RNA recognizes the, um, the uh, sequence, the target sequence, uh, in this case, DNA. It could be single-stranded or double-stranded. In the schematic here, I'm showing double-stranded. It cuts the target. And a little piece of the target of the nucleic acid stays on this complex. And the new... Um, uh, and the enzyme, this the complex is now said to be activated. So this new state is depicted here in blue, uh, which is the activated CRISPR enzyme. After it's been activated, the CRISPR enzyme shows uh, non-specific cleaving of nucleic acid. So the way you develop an assay around this is you include fluorophore quencher pairs. These are synthetic um, DNA molecules in this case only about, say, six to eight bases long. Um, you have a fluorophore that is normally quenched, but now the activated enzyme starts to cleave all nucleic acids. The concentration of these probes, of these uh, signal or probe molecules, or, uh, uh, say, reporter molecules, the concentration of these reporter molecules is uh, significantly higher, typically, than the target. And so it's stoichiometrically, uh, stoichiometrically favored to start cleaving these fluorophore quencher pairs, releasing this fluorescent signal, which is what's being shown here. On the right um, is a depiction, a schematic depiction of the michaelis menten kinetics, which is the most commonly used and to date the most successful model in describing CRISPR kinetics. Um, and it's uh, showing the cis, uh, sorry, the trans cleavage part of the reaction. So this is the activated enzyme acting on the reporter molecules. It's believed that this is the rate limiting step. Uh, and in fact, I, I agree that it is uh, most often the rate limiting step in bioassays. And on the bottom here, we show some ex example uh, raw data on the left. Uh, these are so-called progress curves showing the fluorescence versus time growth for different concentrations of the substrate. You can then uh, extract uh, reaction velocities from each of these, and you plot them into what's called the Michaelis-Menten curve. 
So I'll, I'll mention that more as we go along. When we first got into this uh, CRISPR as a tool for diagnostics, we were very encouraged by the widely reported very high kinetic rates of CRISPR. Um, and here I'm showing two examples, which are basically the seminal papers in the field. These are the first two papers ever to report on CRISPR-Cas uh, enzyme kinetics. Um, uh, on the one on the left is the first to report on Cas12a. The one on the right is the first to report on Cas13, which directly addresses RNA. On the left is from the group of Jennifer Doudna, um, Nobel Prize winner, uh, along with um, Charpentier of Max Planck um, um, in chemistry. Um, so, uh, and Jennifer Doudna, of course, is in Berkeley. So in this paper, they were the first to report this kinetic rate. They reported around 1,200 turnovers per second. This is the KCAT, the catalytic conversion rate, which is the maximum rate you could achieve in a reaction when you have lots of reporters or when you have excess reporters. Um, they reported that this is an enzyme-limited reaction um, um, and uh, with an impressive uh, kinetic rate. So on, on the right, is work by Feng Zhang's group at MIT, also another leader, worldwide leader, in CRISPR assays and CRISPR uh, uh, kinetic type measurements. They reported for the Cas13 something like 1,000 turnovers per second. So we wanted to use it as a tool. Our assays that we develop in my lab are typically microfluidic assays. We take microchips, we apply electric fields, and we can use these electric fields to control flow of liquids, but also to control the motions of molecules moving through the liquid through tiny microchannels. So in this example, I'm showing some work where we um, did some detection of um, the uh, uh, virus that uh, causes COVID-19. So here we're doing um, uh, uh, a process that we call isotacophoresis which is an electric field-based method that we use to both purify the nucleic acid and then mix and concentrate um, the extracted uh, nucleic acid and its ampl amplicons and or its amplicons with the CRISPR kinetics to control the CRISPR assay. In the end, uh, we first tried, and you know, based on these very highly uh, rates that were published for CRISPR kinetics, we thought we could do this without preamplification. We tried it for several months. This is during the initial part of the lockdowns of 2020. Um, eventually, we convinced ourselves that we needed preamplification, uh, despite our estimates, our back of the envelope estimates of uh, this possible sensitivity using this electric field enhancement. So we basically used this electric field to purify nucleic acid. Then we took it off the chip and did lamp amplification, so isothermal amplification. Then we took the amplicon DNA from that amplification, put it back into the same chip, and this time we do CRISPR uh, kinetic assay on the chip. The movie's showing an actual experiment where the, um, the red here is the enzyme uh, that's been uh, 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 labeled red, and the green is the signal from the reporter, which is growing in time, indicating the presence of the uh, COVID-19 vi uh, virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, OK, and we also demonstrated this on uh, patient samples and controls. Um, and we showed it was highly specific, but had limited sensitivity. Um, and that's the reason for, for example, a couple of false negatives in the, in the report. But after we published this, we wanted to go back and ask the question, why is it that we needed this preamplification if CRISPR kinetics are in fact so fast? So we launched our own efforts into CRISPR kinetic uh, studies. Here I'm uh, summarizing the uh, coupled ordinary differential equations associated with the Michaelis-Menten kinetics. Under the Michaelis-Menten uh, approximation, where the complex concentration is relatively steady, uh, for example, you can uh, have this simplified reaction for the reaction uh, for the velocity of the reaction, or this simplified equation for the velocity of the reaction, where the rate of production of product, in this case, cleaved reporter, 
scales as this K-cat, which I've already mentioned, this catalytic conversion, and this K-m, which is the michaelis menten parameter, which is defined as the, um, the sum of the off rates from this complex state, so the reverse rate here and the catalytic conversion rate, divided by the forward rate. Um, and the way you typically determine and measure these kinetic rates is you perform a series of kinetic measurements at different substrate concentrations. Here are the reporter's substrate. You take the maximum reaction velocities from each of those. You create this michaelis menten curve. You do a nonlinear fitting of this to extract Kcat and Km. And these are the uh, kinetic rate parameters of the system. Um, they're determined and governed by a wide range of parameters, including the sequence of the guide RNA, the target sequence, the concentration of the various reagents and the buffer, uh, pH, um, uh, and, and temperature uh, as, as examples. But for a given uh, temperature, for example, uh, and for fixed chemistries, you expect some fairly repeatable kinetic rates. So when we first started doing this, we thought, okay, well, let's use this uh, kinetic uh, michaelis menten model. We developed a nonlinear model, not making the simple assumptions of michaelis menten but solving the full michaelis menten equations, the nonlinear component, or the nonlinear model for michaelis menten We then um, uh, used this model to extract our parameters. We wanted to check our work, so we started taking the kinetic rate parameters published by other authors, we would insert them into our model, and we would use that to try to predict their uh, raw data, their raw curves, or at least the trends in their raw curves. And what we saw were gross discrepancies between the raw data that was published. This is an example from the work of Dubna. Uh, this is the, that science paper that's been already cited a few thousand times. Um, and versus our model's prediction based on the kinetic rates published in that same science paper, okay? So what we're checking here is for self-consistency. And we could not uh, explain this inconsistency between the kinetic rates published in the paper versus the raw data in the paper. This on the right here is another example um, where you can see, for example, the, uh, the raw data seems to be in the linear portion of the uh, reaction kinetics uh, curve, the progress curve, where we predict the linear portion should only be, uh, say, a few ten, a couple tens of seconds. So then we started doing this to, uh, with every published report of CRISPR to date at that time, um, and we again saw only gross inconsistencies in the publications. So in order to try to explain this and rationalize this, we defined three non-dimensional parameters. We called them alpha, beta, and gamma. Um, and these are parameters that can be used to check for the self-consistency of any CRISPR kinetics data. So the first one, alpha, is simply the velocity of the reaction times the time spent in the linear portion. So this is uh, the numerator here is the amount of reporters that are cleaved during the linear, the initial portion of the reaction, divided by the total number of reporters that are in the closed system, right? So this should be less than one. It's a statement of conservation of species. You can't create new reporters. Beta here is the published velocity, so the published uh, rate of production of product in the raw data, divided by the theoretical maximum, where the theoretical maximum is the Kcat times E0, where E0 is the activated enzyme concentration, where uh, to be conservative, you can assume this is equal to the target concentration, assuming every single target created an activated enzyme. That should also be less than one. And the last the, um, non-dimensional parameter that should be less than one is the time spent in the linear portion divided by the time, the characteristic time of the entire reaction. Okay, The time spent near the beginning should be less than the time spent for the whole thing. We then computed these three non-dimensional parameters for all the published data to date. We've uh, continued to do this uh, uh, periodically, and I'll show you uh, some of that work. But what we found is there were gross amounts of inconsistencies throughout this CRISPR field. 
I'm going to move this over here. Gross uh, inconsistencies. So, for example, people reporting 10,000 times more reporter than there is in their reaction, or people reporting 20 or 68,000 times uh, spent at the beginning than in the entire time. Okay. Um, the one sole uh, exception was this work by Kofsky, but even this work by Kofsky cited as the appropriate kinetics of Cas12. They were looking at a modification of CRISPR and, and, and the guide RNA um, combination. And they even they cited their uh, previous work, which was the Dudna Science paper, which uh, has uh, serious problems with it. As you can see, for example, the gamma values. Uh, are on the order of 70 and alpha values are greater than 10. So basically, um, the vast majority of all CRISPR data ever published to date and uh, and and the and, and still the majority today has serious flaws uh, in how it's reported, including inconsistencies with how it's reported. I want to point out that the two, the record for the highest kinetic rates is currently about 4854 versus 4850. This is for a kinetic rate parameter that can probably only be measured within a factor of two. Uh, this is across two different orthologs. Amazingly, these two uh, works are, are almost identical in their reports for the maximum value, where we think the right number is about one turnover per second uh, for these systems. Uh, that are reported here, not 5,000. Um, just to tell you a little about some of our experience in discovering these gross discrepancies across the entire CRISPR diagnostics and CRISPR kinetics fields. Um, we first contacted the, the two authors, including the two seminal papers. We contacted everyone that were, where we saw some discrepancy. We didn't hear back at first from anyone. Eventually, we heard back from Feng Zhang's group uh, and then sometime after that, eventually from Dudna's group, um, not from any of the others. Um, since that time, there's been new papers published. We communicated uh, our findings in great detail, backing up with um, um, uh, data. During that intervening time, there was the uh, Nobel lecture by Professor Dudna, um, at the end of which includes a uh, description of CRISPR kinetics. We submitted our work to science. Science would not accept our submission, would not go to review. Uh, science told us that they would prefer to work with the authors of the original paper uh, when we submitted our confidential manuscript to them. Um, we also submitted a technical note, uh, our work as a technical note to BioArchive, and they wouldn't accept it. Archive also wouldn't accept it which was very surprising. I, I didn't know that our bioarchive rejected papers. Um, um, so they, do, they wouldn't accept it. And in the end, um, uh, and a little chemistry uh, had the courage to take our manuscript to review. Uh, while it was under review, we were able to convince both the MIT and the Berkeley groups of these gross uh, errors. They admitted these errors and they published corrections. So for example, Dudna published the correction uh, going from 1,000 or 1,200 uh, turnovers per second to a much lower value, um, which I'll, I'll show you in a second. Um, so we're very grateful that both that they published this correction and that they cited uh, our lab for pointing out these gross errors uh, that are really distributed throughout the entire field. Um, I'll, I'll just, um, uh, also point out we've, we've tried, uh, we try to engage people, try to ask for raw data and many times people wouldn't share that raw data. So, uh, these are the two corrections that were published on those two seminal papers. We're very grateful that they cited our lab for pointing out these gross errors. Uh, the Dudna group uh, reduce the estimate from 1,200 to about 17. We think the 17 number is still a little high, um, but it's closer probably to the actual value. The Feng Zhang group uh, reduced it from about 1,000 to one. 
The main uh, reasons attributed to this includes uh, sort of uh, unit conversion type errors and calibration errors. Um, if you we've continued to look at the field, and I have here just a few examples. So since then, no other uh, group has made corrections, right? This so we have the situation where in CRISPR kinetics, people across uh, multiple continents. Uh, at least three continents are publishing kinetic rate data that cannot be true, that is inconsistent with its own self. We're not saying our model or our data is correct and they are wrong. We're saying their data is inconsistent with itself. Um, interestingly, um, not many uh, works cite our own work. Um, some cite our own work, but but not for these corrections or not citing this catastrophe in kinetics data, only to cite it as uh, our discussion, for example, of Michaelis Menten kinetics, which are fairly well known in, in many textbooks. Um, here, for example, here they, they have uh, reasonable values for kinetic rates, but uh, they, and they cite our work, um, but for uh, not mentioning this catastrophe, only cited for the importance of KCAT over KM. On the bottom right here, I show two examples where people are still uh, reporting extremely difficult to reconcile numbers, numbers that are uh, crazy high. So here's a KCAT value of a, a thousand per second with four significant figures, right? On, a, on something that should be within a factor of two and probably for this CAS-12A, it's more like order one per second. And here, a rare paper where they publish enough data so that we can calculate the alpha beta values. We see that the alpha beta values, uh, alpha beta and gamma values, especially gamma, are way off, and um, the kinetic rates are wrong, are also grossly inconsistent. Um, I'll also point out that there's also now something almost 700 papers where people publish amplification free CRISPR. Uh, assays. Many of these are difficult to reconcile given the, the known performance of CRISPR kinetics. Uh, for example, this Chem Society Review uh, paper by Lee et al. in 2023 mentions our work, um, but claims that the inconsistent reports might be explained by differences in detectors, which is absolutely wrong. Uh, trying to, I, and I believe, um, trying to downplay this catastrophe in, in the field. Um, this CRISPR journal paper um, is uh, says basically everything's great in CRISPR kinetics and doesn't mention this catastrophe. Um, some uh, publications are so uh, a site as small as two atomolar uh, concentrations, which uh, is, a, is an amazingly low concentration, rivaling PCR for these types of uh, systems. And then to date, what we think is actually the most sensitive and probably the best paper for the most sensitive assays using CRISPR is this work um, from uh, Riken, which is a national lab in Japan, specifically the lab of, the lab of Rikiya Watanabe, who published uh, a single molecule uh, digital assay, uh, which looks like it has around 10 femtomolar uh, sensitivity. So we think this is the, the best legitimate limit of detection. We also believe that these single molecule, the reason these single molecule assays probably offer the most sensitivity is that they might be highly biased toward the fittest individual CRISPR molecules, right? Not all CRISPR molecules are the same. So when you start looking at them one molecule at a time and you can base a signal based on one that's uh, significantly faster than the rest, if you're very careful with background subtraction, you might be able to optimize your sensitivity. And just to show you an example of the type of uh, data that has been published for which there's been no corrections offered and which are very difficult to reconcile. Here's an example assay from 2021 for the detection of SARS-CoV-2 um, using no preamplification. They go straight from a nasal swab into a little chamber that is placed over the, a phone camera, an iPhone camera, and they claim a reported limit of detection of 100, uh, 100 atomolar 
or 100 copies per microliter, again, rivaling PCR, um, using 400 nanomolars of uncleaved reporters. So just the background signal of the reporter concentrations that they use are a million times stronger than the expected signal from the cleaved reporters. Also, it's known that CRISPR has is happy to start cleaving nucleic acid even in the absence even in the absence of target. And for this Cas12 system, we estimate we have estimated the velocity of this background non-specific activity. And in this paper, the reported uh, velocities of signal are 5,000 times smaller smaller than this background activity. So it's very difficult to reconcile this. And again, no correction offered for any other work in CRISPR, even though the vast majority uh, uh, of the pre, uh, of the kinetic rate data that, um, uh, that violate this alpha, beta, gamma are very likely incorrect. And also the assays which do not use preamplification yet claim these extremely high sensitivities, they're uh, very difficult to reconcile with our knowledge and no, no corrections offered for those either. Um, just to show you some of the work that we've done, uh, uh, follow-up work that we've done, we did a um, fairly uh, um, uh, uh, quantitative uh, study of the fundamental limits of, the, of detection of these CRISPR assays. Uh, where we define uh, non-dimensional parameters associated with this. But what we basically have shown is that it's these kinetic rates which directly determine or govern the limits of detection. Um, and the probably the most important background uh, determining the limit of detection is this non-specific activity of the enzyme. Uh, and this is, involves many different reactions uh, here we looked at uh, kinetics of the top five orthologs used in the entire field um, and developed uh, detailed uh, Michaelis-Menten curves for each one. So a lot of work that goes behind that. Um, I'll tell you one more example work that we've done, and that's in um, uh, specificity of CRISPR. We think the real application and the real strength of CRISPR is it's in its specificity, not in its sensitivity. And so here we have um, uh, a study where we systematically looked at every possible mutation, single point mutation in a 20 base pair length of sequence for the E gene in CRISPR and shown, uh, so the starred components here are the um, uh, wild type signal and the background is all the mutations. You see the wild types much stronger. What we have shown is the most specific measure of whether or not your wild type or mutation is not the absolute value of the signal. In fact, that gives you the wrong conclusion often. Um, and it's in fact K cat over KM. So we advocate uh, that you can make assays based on the kinetic rate measurements of the system and using this kinetic rate measurements of each case. So instead of measuring the sample once, you do a whole series of uh, dilutions of reporters, measure the kinetic rates uh, of the combination in that uh, sample and use this to discriminate between wild type and mutations. Uh, and again, this is a huge amount of data. I put the reference down here, which is the work of Charles Blandwet, uh, led by Charles Blandwet, but also uh, Diego uh, Heike. And the previous work here was shown by is uh, Diego Heike and Ramachandra and Ashwin Ramachandra. So with that, I'd like to summarize. Um, we developed an on-chip assay using this. We developed a set of criteria to check for self-consistency. We discovered a gross and frequent discrepancies, basically a catastrophe in the, in the CRISPR kinetics field and, and limits of detection that are being published. Uh, I want to especially thank uh, Ashwin Ramachandran, who was the student working with me to identify this catastrophe and was the first to uh, start working on CRISPR kinetics in our lab. Um, and so uh, he had the courage 
uh, to uh, have the hypothesis that basically the entire field labs across three continents were incorrect, but his uh, his work um, uh, could shed light on this. Um, so thank you very much.